Um, I'm here today to talk about uh, Critical Play. I have a recent book called Critical Play, but more importantly, I, um, I'm really interested in the way we can use play in, in engaging with social issues and social change. And so one of the things that interests me about play is the fact that it's such a part of the human condition. I mean, think about it. We've been playing games since about 6500 BC. There's evidence of games throughout all kinds of tombs, throughout historic sites all around the world. And it's really interesting to look back on that and say, well, what have we been doing as people? And how have we been playing? Have we been using play as uh, uh, self-expression, as a, as a critical thinking tool? So many th interesting things that can happen with play. But I wanted to talk about what animals do <laughs> with play, because play is also uh, something that we share with our friends, the animals. This is why I'm a vegetarian. Um, but, <laughs> but think about what these guys are doing. How do we know that they're playing, and how do they know that they're playing, these tigers, right? There's this posture, there's this position of like, oh, you know, I, I give up my belly, which is vulnerable to you, my friend, because I know what? Because I know that you're not going to hurt me. I know that this, as a tiger, I'm kind of channeling. <laughs> um, I know that as a tiger, I, I feel safe that play is about creating a safe space for experimentation. And actually, if we think about it, in this way, tigers have virtual reality too. Um, think about this one. These like ninja bears, right? I love martial arts among bears. So, so what's happening here? Play can also be a place where we practice, where we practice what we see in our daily lives and go around. So of course, I like talking about animals, but really I'm, I think about how people play. <laughs> and so I wanted to talk today about some examples of the ways in which uh, play has been used to reflect social values and social norms, and then the way in which we could maybe think about consciously designing for those social values and social norms. So this is a um, Dutch dollhouse. It's a 17th century dollhouse. It's the Pippin House of Petronella van Ortman, a very lucky lady. This thing stands, if anyone's been to uh, Amsterdam, it, it, in the Rijks Museum, it's, it's, a, it's a nine foot tall dollhouse. It's really incredible. And what's great about it is that it's not only ornate and beautiful, but it actually serves some pretty interesting purposes, culturally speaking. So for example, we look at the dollhouse and we see um, the different rooms. That wallpaper is actually, of course, very intricately made wallpaper. The, um, there's a linen room drying linens in the attic, and it's actually made of linen. The, um, the, the, the pillows are stuffed with miniature feathers. The um, leather chairs are bound with leather upholstery stuffed with actual. So they're, they're, it's, it's, it's not only a structure for fantasy, but it's a structure for um, training, for aesthetic training. What is a good quality house made of? It also, of course, came with a family of dolls, which are now lost, but it also came with a servant set, a set of servants to go along with the family, because this was a merchant's house. And so it really needed to reflect what was happening in the merchant class of uh, the 17th century in Amsterdam. So you see right here, there are actually two kitchens. One is for the servants, the cook, the scullery maid, um, perhaps the butler would go in there as well. And then one would be a public kitchen for displaying the family porcelain. So all of these cultural and social norms are built into this play artifact. And you know, when we see it, we say, oh, dollhouse, oh, interesting. But really, if we unpack what's actually Actually being shown to us, we can learn a lot about the culture and the values and the kinds of things that people were um, practicing in their play. This is true all around the world. This is an artifact from uh, the Tokyo Museum, and it's a paper, a three-dimensional paper dollhouse, worked very similarly. But um, in the uh, 19th century in the United States, something similar happened, but in a kind of more popular way. Um, many uh, rural houses were being uh, kept up around the country. You know, we didn't have a mall in every town. And so people were shopping through Sears and Robux catalogs and these kind of mail order catalogs. And what's quite interesting is that children would take those catalogs, unpack them, cut things out, and then be able to reassemble them in kind of home domestic fantasy spaces. So here's just a corner of a really large collage type house. And you see the governess uh, reading with, with the children. You see storytelling. You're seeing the, the, you're seeing the kinds of things kids were doing and uh, getting into mischief or whatever. These were, again, reflecting what children were seeing every day. And in fact, there were children's publications that emerged, such as journals and um, kind of periodicals, where children would write their own fantasy stories. So think about contemporary computer games like The Sims and all of the online fiction that's going along with our digital artifacts. This kind of stuff was happening in the 19th century in rural America, which is pretty fascinating. 
Um, one last example from doll play before we go on to another kind of game entirely. We have here a Victorian mourning doll. She's from about the 1890s. And um, she served a pretty interesting purpose. What was happening was uh, a lot of girls were killing their dolls, actually, and like holding mock funerals for them. And so one of the things that... <laughs> that people start catching on. And of course, you know, social mores were very important in Victorian culture. And so, well, what do you do? You have to train girls on how to have a proper funeral. So of course, the doll manufacturers started catching on. You can actually pick these up on eBay in um, uh, various uh, lots of, uh, you know, uh, used doll places, I guess, um, collector sites, where you can pick up what was, uh, you know, funeral attire and various, you know, caskets and things that would, I mean, be actually part of the way in which kids were imagining their social role in the future and what they saw around them. So these examples, I think, help us really see these links between what's happening in culture, what the social norms of the day are, and how we really change our, t our play toys uh, to, to mirror that. Um, here's another example. This is a chess set. This is a Lewis chess set. It's from the Isle of Lewis off of Scotland, and it's from the 12th century. The Lewis chess set was, uh, I mean, a little bit about chess, the history of chess. It, chess came from India and moved through the Middle East and then kind of ended up uh, reaching northern Europe around the 10th century. Um, the original chess sets did not have female characters. The king was helped by his vizier, and the vizier was not female. So <laughs> when chess hit northern Europe, the female character started appearing on the board. And, and this is one of the earlier chess sets in which a female character, she's, she's the worried one. Um, <laughs> and you know why she's worried? She's worried because she actually had the weakest moves on the board when she first emerged on the board. She had the moves that the king now has. And she would actually be able to only like take one step up, one step up. She, she was pretty um, in incapacitated. That is, until uh, the Middle Ages, when strong European queens started emerging. Queen Isabella, um, Queen Ingeborg of Norway, um, and Eleanor of Aquitaine. These, these queens started really changing a lot of cultural norms in Europe, and the strong female characters started being reflected in popular games, such as chess. So the queen emerged victorious and ended up becoming the strongest piece on the board during that time. So now when we play chess, um, the, the, the time in which chess was really a, a fluid and malleable form uh, really does show us that the games have changed through time to reflect the kinds of uh, social norms and social values and customs that um, are, are prevalent. So my talk is called Critical Play, and I guess I want to just notice uh, this word critical, because I think it's, it's, it sounds really serious. It sounds very heavy. But I, I like to think of it in a, in a certain number of ways, and I just put the definition up here for us, because I like to think of it not only as being uh, critical in the terms of uh, dissecting or looking at something very carefully as a scholar, but I also think it's this critical moment that we have, that popularity of games is very, very um, uh, important across the world. Um, you know, World of Warcraft, everybody in the room probably knows about World of Warcraft, has 11 million players, and that is dwarfed by um, a game out of Asia called Ragnarok, which actually has 40 million subscribers. So we, we, we look at these online games, we look at games that we play, and we say, wow, this is really about cultural importance. What are those games reflecting about what we're living through now? That's an interesting question, I think. So, well, that's all well and good. Let's study games. Let's talk about them as cultural artifacts, as very important cultural artifacts. But what do you do when you want to make something, and you want to make something new? How do you innovate? How do you say, what would be a new game? What would be a new game that reflects something I think is important? that maybe my, my society or my culture might think is important. So that's where I want to go next. And this is a pragmatic turn as a designer. This is something that I like to do in the lab here that I started uh, called Tilt Factor. It's at Dartmouth. And the students and I, we, we get together and we say, OK, well, how do you move forward in these, in these areas? So here are some examples. This may be familiar to you if you are a gamer person. It is a joystick from a, an Atari 2600, uh, 1980s computer, personal home computer, um, one of the first consoles. It, it was actually marketed to families. So Pong, you know, um, lots of everybody has their favorite games from this uh, console. And if everyone doesn't know what this is, you can always come to the lab and play mine that I had since seventh grade. But, um, <laughs> but um, anyway, the, 
So if, if you look at this object, so let's think about this object. You, one plays with a home console when it's using you know, one's, one's hand. It, it's not a Wii. This was from the 1980s. But still, our, our, our controller is for one person. That model of one person, one control. Well, what happens when we change the scale of this object? What happens when we say, huh, let's take something familiar and make it unfamiliar? What happens in this case is that people start collaborating. That you can take something that isn't a collaboration tool, that is familiar, that is comfortable to a lot of people, and by just shifting it in terms of scale, in terms of purpose, in terms of location, you can suddenly change a lot of behavior that goes along with that. So now this joystick is a collaboration tool. This girl is actually having to communicate with these other girls. The stick's pretty big, so sometimes it takes three or four people, depending on your height. Um, and this, is, this allows us to uh, completely shift something social and something about the values that are in this project. Here's another example. Popular game, Bejeweled. Many people play a kind of matching game on a cell phone. Um, we have many uh, little, these are abstract shapes, you know, relatively jewel-like, I guess. Um, you can, you're supposed to line up three or four of them in a row, and then they'll drop off the screen. Well, hmm. So let's take something familiar like this and say, what if we made it about a social issue? What if we took that exact same paradigm and said, OK, enough of this abstract shape. Let's make this about real people. In fact, let's make this about layoffs. Let's take this little simple game and tell stories about the people who are being laid off. Let's make those jewels into workers who are going through a redundancy process. Let's take the real news that's going, that are going on about the finance and the economy and put that into the game. What kinds of things happen when we introduce story, narrative, empathy into something that we kind of considered a simple little game? Pretty interesting things, I think. Um, along these lines, uh, there are a couple different studies I wanted to just mention in relationship to this idea of critical play. Because we're learning things all the time that seem new, but are, you know, what is really new? You have to wonder. Coloring and drawing aren't very new practices, right? Um, but this, there's a study on this that actually tells us a lot about games and contemporary computer games, and also about social change. So, of course, kids, when they're getting together in a classroom, love to draw in color. <laughs> Even kids who don't perceive themselves as having a lot of drawing talent, it's still fun to sit down before you have those preconceived notions and create something new. It's just inherently pleasurable to make something new, reflect your world, and to have uh, a, a new way of, of, of experiencing uh, through this kind of active self-expression. Um, but let's just say that you start getting rewarded. We reward these children by lots of different kinds of things, by gold stars, by uh, uh, lots of uh, you know, grades. We start introducing um, pleasurable, like, like noticeable reward structures into this act. Well, um, Nesbitt in 1973 showed that, in fact, this kind of action about giving rewards to kids who have an intrinsically pleasurable relationship to something actually decreases their pleasurable relationship to something. So for example, here, while the rewards were going up for kids who are drawing, um, as we increase the number of rewards, the actual time that children chose to spend on drawing decreased. So what does this tell us about game? Well, what does this tell us about a lot of things, but <laughs> including grades and all kinds of other things. But what does this tell us about how we can deal with social change if we're trying to change um, and introduce human values and social, good social behaviors into our games, well, what does it mean to then perhaps give rewards, which we're very used to in games, would that decrease someone's inherent desire to do good in the world? Interesting question. Here's a, a, a screen grab from World of Warcraft. It's a little event that's going on in World of Warcraft. And um, thinking about game rewards, and there's, a, um, there's something called a, value, uh, a variable ratio reward schedule. And this is when, so for example, let's say we go raiding in World of Warcraft. And we go and kill you know, monsters, or we go com combat monsters. And occasionally, we get some loot. We get some good stuff out of our combat, right? Well, um, that doesn't happen all the time. In fact, the very idea that it's unpredictable is the magical thing about going on uh, uh, raids or even slot machines, the kind of randomness. But we get enough feedback and we win enough times that there's a good ratio 
of reward, right, to effort, at least an effort that we, we, don't we don't turn off. Many people still go to Las Vegas and use slot machines, and many people play World of Warcraft, even though every single move isn't rewarded. But that re variable reward uh, rate, the schedule, is something that uh, gives us some interesting notions. And what happens here is, so I go off and I have combat with like between one and let's say 1,000 monsters. Well, I may get an amazing amount of surprise loot after three monsters battle, or I may get it at 900. That's the interesting question. There's a sweet spot in there. And game designers know this. And so we, we are always designing um, experiences where that, that ratio is something reasonable and it motivates people. And in fact, it's been, co it's been compared to an addiction that the way in which motivation is designed into game experiences. Now, how does that really relate to questions of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation if we are really looking for that loot in the World of Warcraft style game? Um, this goes on and uh, this goes across all different kinds of game examples. So anyway, these are open questions. There, there are no actual um, answers to these. These are places where we have to make things and try things out to see what, what the answers are, actually. And that's what we do at the lab. This is one um, product that we've done called Grow a Game Cards. And they're actually made to help designers come up with new games and new game ideas that incorporate human themes and human values that don't leave out those important parts of being people. And um, here's some examples of what we can do with these kinds of cards. So we can ask questions like, what if? What if we took a game we're all familiar with, like Pac-Man, and we add the value of collaboration? How, what kind of game would that produce? Co collaborative Pac-Man. Maybe there are several Pac-Man. So coming up with brainstorming ideas. But then let's take other things, like what if we don't want to just innovate on what's already been done? What if we must try something new? We can do singing and incorporate the value of peace. Or we can take something old and make it about democracy. Or we can use haunting very strange things and human values. We can add all these kinds of new combinations of design constraints. And this is how we'll make more interesting games, more important games, and games that reflect our real lived social conditions, hopefully for the better. Thank you. <laughs>